Are you frazzled, tired, and stressed beyond belief? Well, visit eastwesthealing.com forward slash stress reduction manifesto to download our free guide and learn three steps to nourish and flourish while helping you define exactly what you need to support yourself nutritionally, conquer stress, increase energy, and live the life that you desire. Alrighty, this is Josh Ruman from East West and Fulmins, and today I want to talk about fasting. Is it beneficial for us? Well, you know, when we talk about fasting, I'm really just talking about, you know, there are some people that fast, they don't eat for a day, they don't eat for two days, they don't eat for a week, whatever it may be. Of course, I'm definitely not a fan of that for many reasons, which I'll talk about. At the same time, when I'm talking about fasting, I'm really talking about people not eating the right foods to uh, meet their metabolic demands, what the body can actually break down not eating a proper food frequency or ratios and grams and calories to meet their metabolic needs on a daily basis. We have a lot of people that are actually increasing the demands they place in their body, but decreasing the amount of energy they're taking in. So from our standpoint, that's fasting. At the same time, there's a lot of diets out there. <clears throat> I don't know what they are, and I don't want to call any diet out, but where they're promoting maybe a high protein diet in relation to carbs and fats, or a high fat diet in relation to proteins and carbs or a super high carb diet with very little protein and fat etc for us it's all about balance and if you're doing any of those to us <clears throat> you're actually fasting because you're not giving the body exactly what it needs on a daily basis you're not meeting um, the demands of what you're placing on your body with what you're putting in your body so you have an imbalance which creates imbalanced physiology and we see this in the symptoms of, of, that people are having. You know, they're getting GI symptoms are increasing, bloating, gas, diarrhea, you know, PMS, clotting, things like that. We're seeing insomnia, anxiety, cognitive issues, difficulty concentrating. We're seeing sleep issues, restless leg syndrome. Um, we're seeing people who have fatigue, they don't have energy to get through the day. Um, they work out all the time and they feel flabby. Those are signs that your body is actually in a catabolic state. And it's really simple. I don't really care what you're doing. If you think it's working for you and you feel great or you don't feel great, it doesn't matter. All you really need to do is take your body temperature and pulse. You can take your pulse here, here, wherever you want to take it. You can get a digital thermometer to take your body temperature and pulse when you wake up in bed laying down in the morning. That's your baseline temperature. If you want to learn more about this and what it means, you can study the work of Rhoda Barnes. But the bottom line is what you're looking at is you're looking at the basics of oxidative metabolism. You're looking at is what you're doing and the demands you're placing on your body, are they actually equal? Are you creating balance or do you have something that's out of balance? Now, when our cells are breathing properly, we make a lot of carbon dioxide, ATP, and water, which is basically energy to simplify it. They are the the, we could say, byproducts, end products of what we call glucose oxidation or oxidative metabolism. And we call them that because our cells, when they're using oxygen and using glucose efficiently, we produce energy. And that's the state we want to be in. So when we have a normal temperature and a normal pulse, which I'll put a couple videos down here that correlate to this, we know that our cells are actually using glucose and oxygen efficiently, and we know we're in a metabolic state. Now, when there's optimal respiration, oxidative respiration and carbon dioxide is being produced from glucose, hemoglobin actually releases oxygen to the cells. This actually provides a continuous release of oxygen for continued cellular respiration. So it's a huge feedback mechanism. This is why this is so important. Now, if we look at carbon dioxide, this is exactly where we want to be. This is what we're seeing in a simplistic sense from our temperature and pulse you know, carbon dioxide, as I mentioned, is the end product of efficient oxidative metabolism. And it actually facilitates and keeps that, that mechanism going. It restrains the production of lactic acid, which I'll talk about. It makes oxygen more available to the tissues so we can keep um, energy production going. It inhibits stress, inflammation, and free fatty acid production, which I'll talk about. It regulates intracellular calcium, which is huge, because anytime anything is stressed, whether it's a tissue or cell, water typically moves in. In efficient oxidative metabolism, water actually moves away. And when water moves in, we get hyperhydration of the cells, the tissues, we get uh, the cells hold on to estrogen and calcium, and things get hard. Things get very excitatory, except, like the heart itself. It supports the immune, immune system and it promotes the uh, efficient use of glucose. Now, that's where we want to be. 
That's exactly what we want to be when we're eating the right foods that the body can break down. We're eating the right frequencies and ratios and calories to meet our metabolic demands based off our body temperature and pulse. Now when our cells through the energy storehouse, our mitochondria, are not, we could say, breathing properly, this equates to a sharp decrease or decreased production in carbon dioxide, ATP, and water. This is not when our cells are breathing properly. This is when we're actually producing excess lactic acid. This is an efficient, an inefficient way of producing energy. And with as many diets out there that have been designed to compensate for that state and push us deeper into that state and push us on relying on free fatty acids and things like that or gluconeogenesis for energy production when we're in this inflamed state, but it's not an efficient way of producing energy. And I'll talk about that. So when we're producing enough carbon dioxide and we're using oxygen efficiently, it restrains lactic acid. But when excess lactic acid is being produced, what you're seeing is your cells have two choices, produce carbon dioxide or energy, which is very efficient, it's metabolic, it's protective, it regulates blood sugar. But if we're producing lactic acid, it's the inefficient end product of oxidative metabolism. It creates hypoxia at the cell level. It actually opposes CO2 it's an energy toxin. It increases cellular um, uptake of estrogen and calcium. It's excitatory. It's immunosuppressive. And it actually damages your mitochondria, which is the energy uh, producing part of the cell and promotes the wasting of glucose, which can easily lead to blood sugar handling issues. Now, what does this have to do? You're going to have to make these correlations to what I'm talking about, as well as to some of the other YouTubes that I'll put down there. But when we're fasting or not meeting our metabolic needs, many things are going on. Well, the first thing is, in order to regulate our blood sugar, when we're not meeting our needs, the body says, I need energy, because our cells actually use glucose to produce energy. Now, if we rewind it, it's very important because, and I've talked about this before in many videos, your liver is not just a detox organ. It plays a huge role in carb, protein, fat metabolism, phagocytosis, storage of vitamin A, D, E, and K, and iron, et cetera, et cetera. But it's an energy bank account. It actually is the largest place in the body that's going to store glycogen. So we need to get the right balance of carbs, proteins, and fats throughout the day in our food frequency as well. So we can actually store glycogen in the liver so we don't push our body into a state of uh, gluconeogenesis. At the same time, so the liver can actually use an enzyme to convert the stored glycogen to glucose to convert over 85% of the thyroid hormone in the liver from T4 to T3, and we need glucose to do that. So we can actually use that in the cell to produce energy. So you can see how important it is to have that balance of you know, glucose in our diet, and a lot of people are so afraid of carbs. It comes down to eating the right carbs. And if you're eating a high protein diet, or we say a low carb diet, the problem is you're pushing your body into the state of fasting, into gluconeogenesis, which is very catabolic, which I'll talk about. Sorry. So if we're not meeting our metabolic needs, and we're not storing glu um, glycogen, and we're not producing energy, and we're in this inflammatory state, the problem is if you're not taking it in, the body is an adaptive mechanism. And it really says, I need this because I need this to produce energy to live. And if I don't have it, I need to get it from somewhere else. So the body actually releases glucagon. And it's the most active hormone in, in this kind of fasted state when we're not eating enough. And the problem is glucagon over time promotes gluconeogenesis, which I'll talk about. It promotes ketogenesis, lipolysis, and the breakdown of our muscle tissues or proteins. Now, when we're not getting, it basically does the opposite of insulin. It tries to raise uh, blood sugar levels in the body along with cortisol. It's a glucocorticoid cortisol. So we're not getting enough sugar and we have high cortisol levels. That's a sign that we're not meeting our metabolic needs. We're not producing energy. Now, when we're not eating enough food and we're in this state, we can call it the fasted state or just not eating enough food. The body or the liver says, I still want to try to break glycogen down to glucose to be released into the blood to increase blood glucose levels. And of course, you know, we've talked about different systems in the body and their primary sources of fuel is typically glucose. This goes into hyperdrive when we're kind of not meeting our metabolic needs. So of course, this is a huge burden to the liver, but the problem is most people aren't storing enough glycogen. And a lot of the times, the body or the liver is pushed into a state of gluconeogenesis initially. Now, over time, if we're not meeting our metabolic needs, the kidneys will actually take over 
which is again is a huge burden to the kidneys. Now when we're not eating enough, we go into this gluconeogenesis state in the liver, the liver actually starts to break down its own proteins to amino acids. And those amino acids to keto acids to enter the gluco I'm sorry, the gluconeogenesis kind of cycle per se to make glucose. As I mentioned, in a prolonged state, the kidneys will actually take over. The problem is this is not an efficient way of producing energy. Yes, you're producing glucose, but you're doing it in a catabolic state. You're actually starting to break down adipose tissue into free fatty acids, which are a huge metabolic burden to the liver, and in turn produces tons of keto acids, which is a huge metabolic burden, not only to your blood sugar levels, cell energy production, but to the kidneys. And at the same time, you start to break down muscles, our muscle tissue, this is why a lot of people actually feel flabby. And over time, the problem is, a lot of these byproducts that are actually being produced, the hormones that are actually being released to break down proteins, to break down triglycerides, to produce glucose or free fatty acids, are actually all inhibitory to cellular respiration that I talked about at the beginning. So now, the state that you're in, the diet that you're in, the way you're eating, you think is so healthy, you might be producing glucose from this adaptive state, but it's a catabolic state. And now everything you're producing is inhibiting cellular respiration. So now you might be eating a diet that you might feel good on right now, but at the expense of damaging metabolism. And you'll see this in body temperature and pulse. You'll see this with cold hands, feet, cold nose, anxiety, sleep problems, and things like, things like this. Excessive weight loss. And then when you maybe go back to eating normal, you actually have weight gain. So the problem with being in this state is a lot of the things that are being produced from ammonia, uric acid, ketone bodies, uh, acetyl-CoA, all these things become a huge metabolic burden to the liver, to the systems in your body, and what you're doing is you're putting your body into this adaptive mechanism state, this gluconeogenesis, and you're basically telling your body that this is how you're going to get energy. The problem is this is a catabolic state. This is an energy deficient catabolic state that the body does not want to be in. It's designed to use gluconeogenesis in the state when in a maybe a, a state of stress, but we should be able to actually bounce back to homeostasis and use stored glycogen to do this. But if you continue down this path and not meet your metabolic needs, not taking carbohydrates, etc., etc., over time what happens is you actually teach the body to rely on most of these byproducts for energy production instead of glucose, which is a huge energy drainer. So what's my point in this? My point of this is it's really simple. That's the technicality of it, but it's really simple. The simplicity is if you learn to eat the right foods that feed your metabolism and the right frequencies, ratios, grams, calories to meet your metabolic needs based off your body temperatures and pulse, you can actually lose weight and eliminate your symptoms by regulating your blood sugar. And that's what this is all about. Because I mentioned if you regulate your blood sugar, you store glycogen, you convert thyroid hormone, you use it in your cell, and you produce energy. Boom, I'm out of here.